I take the honor now to welcome all of you in celebration of the iconic event in celebrating the 75th year of independence for a nationwide conference on the team creating wealth through stock markets. Well, this evening, ladies and gentlemen, the Department of Investment and Public Asset Management takes the initiative of educating and empowering people in 75 cities across India about investments and creating wealth as on the steps taken by the government for ensuring financial growth of her citizens. We will be virtually connected across 75 cities and where our Honorable Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs, Srimati Nirmala Sidharaman will be connected to this conference from JN Data Auditorium, IISC, Bangalore. We have Sri Alantam Shi, Jamia, former Chief Secretary and CEO, Investment and Development Authority of Nagaland. As you are aware, and I say this in each one of the Finance and Corporate Affairs Ministries program this week, from Monday, the 6th of June, Honorable Prime Minister inaugurated the 75 years celebrations of the Ministry of Finance and Corporate Affairs. Each day, one department has taken it upon itself to showcase as to what the department in all these 75 years has done in the service of the people of India. And in, in that progress, we've had corporate affairs, expenditure, and the Department of Economic Affairs all doing their bit Deepam is one such a department in uh, the Ministry of Finance, which incidentally has also seen public assets being managed under one particular type of dispensation in the first decade, first two decades, or even first three decades. And gradually, the public asset management has taken a totally different, probably uh, contour, objective, and also the purpose with which it has been managed has changed. And when I say this, I refer to the change in the way in which Indian economy itself got perceived. Initially, it was so much centrally planned, centrally driven, a mix of socialistic uh, management of our public assets. Creation of several of these public assets also happened at that time because, and naturally, in areas where it was difficult to draw private investment, it had to be public investment, and therefore government had to invest in building huge dams or electricity generation units, or even assets which are otherwise very difficult for the private sector to invest in, either because of the size or even because of the long-term invested money not giving adequate returns. So the nature of the way in which the economy had to be managed itself was a centrally different driven and India at that stage of development couldn't have had enough private capital coming in. Although the private capital did exist even from the British days. Then nearer 1991 is when because of a certain situational development India opened up its economy post which you had quite a few investments from the private sectors coming in and also public sector loosening itself saying do I need to do it this much and uh, for this long can my efficiencies improve and so on. So the nature of the public asset management itself had changed and clearly after February 2021 budget announcement where a policy for public sector enterprises was announced, clearly marking a directional change, and that directional change um, stated, and that is uh, discussed very much in the parliament and approved by the parliament, the directional change meant that except for the core areas or the strategic sectors, which were grouped as four different areas, four groups of areas, the public sector uh, presence in the other areas would be gradually reduced. Private sector was allowed to be in all the sectors, even in the strategic sectors. Now, as a result of which you find, even in areas like space, a lot of startups coming in and wanting to contribute. Atomic energy as well has been opened up. So again, interests among small, uh, you know, uh, reactors, which can be used for civilian purposes, are also being considered by private investors. 
So this opening up of all the areas for private sector has actually brought in a lot of interest in the private sector in these areas and those are uh, coming to fruition in the form of investments concretely made and in some the public sector is actively co collaborating with the private sector. Space for instance has a lot of startups working with the ISRO. So ISRO exists but the private sector has also joined hands and they are partnering on very many things. So the public sector asset management and its contours have changed drastically but changed for the better for efficiency, better for result. And that is why I recall what has been said or shown in this video film before us that post 1999-2004 tranche of investment opening up, meaning disinvestment, strategic disinvestment which happened at that time, you find those companies which had been strategically disinvested now be giving better returns on equity, better returns of, uh, on investment made, better returns in terms of uh, profits for the shareholders, gross profit which is being made by these companies are now so different and they are able to compete with their peers. Now if strategic disinvestment has brought in that big advantage and that is now proved before us, because between 1999 and 2004, those which have been invest, disinvested have now had 20 years on their own, to a large extent being driven by professionally run goals. As a result, you find that they have only improved for the better. So this principle of reserving only four groups of areas for public sector to be present, reserving in the sense of for their presence, but not reserving in the sense of stopping private investment from coming. Private investment is allowed even there, as I said a bit earlier. So the, the nature of work of Deepam today is largely to look at professionalizing uh, organizations, strategically disinvesting them so that the management control is given to people who can run it much better, and also to get us fresh equity capital. So the principle with which this investment is happening now is not to shut down a unit. That's very important for us to understand. It is not to shut down a unit. Economy needs that many number of such uh, companies, but also very many more as well. So if we want to have that activity done professionally and open up spaces for a lot many more people to come and do it, our interest is not to shut down. We want to prime it up. We want to have them run far more efficiently so that there can be contributions made to the economy. It is not just jobs, but for instance, if I were to take the example of a steel company, which I want to disinvest, it's also because the country needs more steel production. I want more equity to come into it. I want professionally managed people who can run those and produce steel far more efficiently, far more cost effectively. And therefore, disinvestment and the principle of uh, disinvestment is to make sure those companies are in the hands of people who can run it, bring in more capital, and be able to produce the same thing. So it's not to close down, but to give an opportunity for better and more investments to be made. Now, one other thing which is distinctly happening through the bond market route, which is also part of what Deepam does, is to classify all those uh, AAA-rated companies, the public sector enterprises, and then put them as exchange-traded stocks. So if you are putting into the ETF market, the exchange-traded funds markets, AAA-rated CPSC shares, you get quite a good lot of, this is bond I'm talking about, you get quite a good response. Today, you have seen between 2019, I think in July 2019, the first Bharat ETF came out. Bharat ETF specifically refers to the CPSCs who are getting into the bond market. We have come into the monetary monetized world barely about 150 years ago. 
And even now we are carrying across that concept of uh, tribal thinking where we do not really think in terms of savings and investments. And uh, we are living in a, in, in a world where you know the money actually does not matter. The first thing that the tribal does when he gets all of money is trying to buy a piece of land, maybe build a house, then again buy a car, and that's how he spends all his money. Not that there's so much finances around, but the concept and the ideas of saving are starting only of late, last 10, 15 years. That is what I've observed. And um, this concept also, unfortunately for the rest of the country, to a large extent has been uh, prevalent. Like we have heard the speaker saying that uh, the, the uh, financial inclusion policies has been crystallized only in, after 2014. There was a lot of talk of it. And uh, the financial literacy program has been going on. We've been talking about the financial inclusion things, but then things have uh, been taken, take, it has taken a long time for things to be in place. It is for this reason that uh, we in the Investment and Development Authority, we have been working to find out how and why the investments are not uh, coming into Nagaland. Perhaps there is the problem of the, the, the legal, the constitutional provisions of Article 371A where the land transfer is not taking place. There is also the issue of skilled labor. There is also the issue of law and order. These are some of the things we talk about. But yet, the most important thing as I realize today is an issue of financial, the capital market being known and understood by the people and it is time that Nagas also started thinking and talking about the capital markets. I have said that the first thing which the, uh, the, the person invests in is his own needs and requirements, land, cars, house. There is hardly anyone in Nagaland who is investing it in somebody else's business. I have not heard of any such investment. Now that is actually the basis on which the investment process starts.